I mean, it's clean water for people, right? Regardless of your religion, regardless of your politics, regardless of where you stand on contentious social issues of the day. Like everybody wants people to have clean water. Right? It's an inarguable common good. Hey there. Thanks for joining for another episode of Impact in the 21st Century, a podcast by Symbi Foundation, which celebrates the impactful work being done around the globe and shares the stories of the inspiring individuals who are behind it. My name's Aaron, and I'm the host of Impact in the 21st Century. In this series, we're focusing on the people working to protect our natural world, innovate greener technologies, and ensure that no one's left behind in the process. In each episode, I'll be speaking with an impactful author, founder, activist, or changemaker about the actions they're taking in this space. And in doing so, I also aim to tease out what we can all be doing to lead more impactful lives. But before we get into today's episode, let me tell you about something I'm deeply passionate about, Simbi Foundation, a nonprofit organization working in collaboration with the United Nations to enhance access to education and refugee settlements in Uganda. Simbi Foundation builds bright boxes, solar powered classrooms built from shipping containers that provide educational technology, digital learning material, and sustainable energy through a microgrid to entire schools and communities. If you'd like to learn more, feel free to visit simbifoundation.org. And if you'd like to support Simbi Foundation and our podcast, we welcome you to like and subscribe to help more people discover the podcast. And a huge thank you to RBC for sponsoring this episode. And on the show today, how founder and social innovator Scott Harrison transitioned from nightclub promoter to founder of Charity Water, a global organization which has provided over 15 million people with access to clean water. And Scott, it is so good to connect with you. Thanks for taking the time to join. Thanks for having me on. This will be fun. So how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. I mean, we just mentioned, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the back to back to back and a lot of context shifting. And I was looking forward to this. I appreciate that. I've been looking forward to this for a while. And I'll tell you when Simbi Foundation as an organization was updating some of our marketing collateral and our website, okay. we, we actually looked at Charity Water and took so much inspiration from how you guys just delight donors. And uh, okay. it's really inspiring, the work that you're doing. That's definitely intentional. So I, I'm glad that gets noticed. Yeah, it does. So before we jump right in, I'm going to share a brief list of your accomplishments to provide oh, some context no. for the convo. Let me, let me know when it's over. <laughs> you got it. So I'm incredibly excited to have you on the podcast and share your inspiring story from promoting nightclubs in New York to declaring moral bankruptcy and asking yourself, what would the exact opposite of your life look like? And two years later, founding Charity Water, an organization dedicated to solving this global water crisis. And since then, Charity Water's raised over well over $550 million, funded well over 78,000 water projects in 28 countries. You've been recognized as Fortune Magazine's uh, you know, top 40 under 40, Forbes Impact 30, Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business, author of an incredible book, Thirst, New York Times bestseller, a father of two, um, more recently getting into the Bitcoin space uh, to further Charity Water's impact. And am I missing anything here? Let's get into it. <laughs> no. you're, you're too kind. All right. So something I find quite remarkable about you is, and unique, is how honest and open you are about your history. And I know a lot of people who kind of hide from aspects of their past, and you seem to harness it as a superpower. And I'd love you to understand the events that led from you working as a nightclub promoter to the founder of the world's <laughs> largest charity for water. Yeah, yeah, water charity. There's the definitely bigger charities, but I think we have the water charity title at the moment. Um, well, you know, I think you have to step back a little before that. I, I was raised in a very conservative home uh, when I was four, middle, middle class home. My dad was a businessman. Uh, I had a small firm. My mom was a writer. And there was this family tragedy that happened when I was four, when we moved to a new house to get closer to his job so that he could spend more time with me. And, you know, they had visions of a, of a big family. Uh, and, and unknown to us, there was a terrible carbon monoxide gas leak in the house and we all start getting these weird symptoms. And one day my mom, kind of the, the canary in the coal mine, she, she collapses unconscious. Uh, we take her to the hospital, long series of blood tests. 
and they discover massive amounts of carbon monoxide in her bloodstream. Uh, my dad actually found the leak himself and we bounced back over time because our exposure had been much less than hers and she just never did. So I think, you know, kind of act one of my life was uh, I was brought up in a Christian family, you know, kind of non-denominational, but we went to church every Sunday and uh, I played piano and my, I took care of my mom. I took care of, an, of, a, of a disabled mother. Uh, there was no more family. Family planning had stopped with this accident. And if you'd asked me, you know, what I was going to do when I was growing up, I was going to be a doctor to help sick people like my mom. Uh, there was no straight smoking. There was no drinking. There was no having sex. There was no squaring. I was just that good kid, uh, being, being brought up in a conservative family. And, you know, I, I kind of hate this part of the story because it's just so cliche. Uh, it's just so kind of ordinary, but at 18, I rebelled and I moved to New York city and I said, I want to smoke. I want to drink. I want to have sex. I want to curse. Uh, I want to explore the big world that's out there outside of the walls of religion or faith or, you know, even morality, I guess. And that led to this uh, profession, so act two, as a nightclub promoter. And I, uh, you know, at least I said to myself, maybe the original thing, if you are going to rebel, you should rebel in style. <laughs> and I realized that there was this crazy occupation where you could get paid to drink and party for a living. <laughs> you can make pretty good money. Uh, going to dinner at 10 and the nightclub at midnight and you know, stumbling home at five in the morning and being around beautiful, famous people, rich people. So I thought that was you know, the, the meaning in life to, to see and be seen and to chase the sports car and the Rolex watch and the vacations and the models around the world and you know, who are on the cover of magazines and you know, unfortunately, I did that for 10 years and I worked at 40 different nightclubs and, and really did get to, to the very top of uh, that kind of bizarre profession of running nightclubs in, in New York City and throwing parties. But, you know, maybe no surprise that along with the vices, uh, along with the smoking and the drinking and the sex and the drugs, you know, comes a sense of lack, you know, of one. So I don't think this will surprise anybody, but somebody always had a more beautiful girlfriend who was, you know, on the cover of a more famous magazine. Someone always had a better car. They always had a better watch. Uh, they had more money. They, they had a better loft in New York City. And there was this, I was on this kind of hamster wheel of more, 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 more uh, to, to win validation. And, and all of these markers of success were really, you know, empty once, once I achieved any of those markers. Right. So you know, the turning point was this, this moment when I was 28 years old, I went on vacation to South America, to uh, Punta del Esta, which is a party town in Uruguay. And we were with all the right people. And at the time, my girlfriend was on the cover of a fashion magazine. And I thought she was the most beautiful girl on the whole compound. And, you know, I had the BMW, I had the stupid watch. And I just remember feeling so unhappy. <laughs> I mean, I was in love with her. She wasn't in love with me. The car, you know, wasn't that nice of a BMW. You know, the watch wasn't that nice. And just kind of realizing, oh my gosh, I mean, if this plays out, uh, I'm just going to be an unhappy person. And I think maybe more important, like, what did I do? What did I accomplish? If, my, if I died today, what would my tombstone read? And it would read, here lies a guy who got a million people drunk and made some money doing it. I mean, that, that's really the only contribution that I had made to society. And I realized I wanted to come back to you know, a very lost faith, a very lost morality, try to rediscover these things as an adult. And what I, you know, what I realized, Aaron, was a, a pivot was not needed, a small course correction was not what was needed. This was like, find every single thing that I'm doing and do the exact opposite. You know, find the opposite intention for life. You know, go find that 180 degrees. And, you know, there, there's a lot more. I, I wound up writing a, a book. So there's kind of a couple chapters of like, you know, th there are more details in there. But yeah. long story short, if you, if you fast forward, 
six months, my big idea was sell everything I own and go serve on a humanitarian uh, mission for one year. Kind of give one of the 10 years back to in service and see where that would take me. I really didn't know. You know, I, I wouldn't have said, oh, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. It was just try it out. And that seemed pretty opposite. And that led me to war-torn Liberia, West Africa, uh, at the, the near, just at the end of a 14-year civil war, a brutal war that had been waged with children that left the country without electricity, without running water, without sewage, you know, without, without a mail system. Hmm. And there was one doctor for every 50,000 people living in the country. And I was joining a mission full of doctors who had come from all over the world to, to try to use their skills to try to serve people who didn't have access to medical care, who, who couldn't afford it, even if, they're, even if it was available. And, and, and you were a you photojournalist know, that, with them? Yeah, yeah. So and I was like, you know, I said to this organization, I, I'm a pretty good photographer as a hobby and I'm a pretty good writer. You know, let me come and tell stories of the impactful work you're doing. And they did have this role. So it's not like it was completely made up. Um, but I think I also knew that I might be able to bring some of the people uh, from Club Life along for the journey. And I had an email list at the time of, of about 15,000 people you know, back when open rates were, you know, what, 90%. So, you know, I, I think I realized that maybe I could tell a new story with my life and I could maybe even tell a new story to the same people I'd been getting drunk uh, for the last 10 years. So life changed so quickly. I quit smoking. I quit drinking. I, you know, later went back to, I love craft beer and, and <laughs> wine, but, you know, I, I did quit drugs completely. Um, I just kind of walked away from, you know, all of the vices of, of my former life. And there was something really symbolic about walking up the gangway of a 522 foot hospital ship. So this is, this is how the mission got its doctors in a giant hospital ship and kind of sailing away from my old selfish sycophantic life into this new life with a group of doctors, you know, who are going to change the world and who are going to help people. So that really started act three, uh, where I, I landed in Liberia as this photojournalist with, uh, on, on a hospital ship with 350 other people. And, and then I just go back for a second year, and it's really that second year that I discover the water crisis, the water problem. And I learned that half of the people in the country don't have access to clean water. And then I learned that half of the disease in the country is because people don't have access to clean water and or access to sanitation and, and hygiene. So it's for me, it's kind of the root cause of so much of the sickness that our doctors are treating that we're putting the Band-Aid on. But, you know, millions of people don't have water. So I really discover that connection between water and health and then say, well, maybe I should go and work on this bigger global problem, which at the time there were a billion worldwide. We've actually made a lot of progress uh, as a sector over the last 15 years. So that was how I jumped into water. And, you know, uh, I was 30 at the time. I came back to New York City. I was completely broke. I was living on a closet floor uh, in, in Manhattan of a, of a friend's. And I just said, I think I'm going to try to bring clean and safe drinking water to everybody in the world and build a movement, raise awareness, raise as much money uh, as possible from, you know, from the poor, from the middle class, from the rich. And, and try to build a machine that turns money into clean water in an efficient and transparent and sustainable way. And, you know, boy, I mean, lots of challenges along the way, but, you know, we'll, we'll raise $100 million this year. We'll help 2 million new people get access to wow. clean water. And to be honest, Aaron, it's a fraction of what I think we should be doing. I mean, I'm deeply dissatisfied you know, I think you said we've raised 600 million or so. I mean, that's a fraction of what we should have raised in 15 years. I mean, this is a huge problem. It's a solvable problem. There's a lot of money out there. And we've only captured the imagination of, you know, what, a, a couple million people, you know, to give $600 million. So I really believe the best is yet to come. And the, the opportunity, I mean, it's clean water for people, right? 
regardless of your religion, regardless of your politics, regardless of where you stand on contentious social issues of the day. Like everybody wants people to have clean water. Right? It's an inarguable common good. So you're allowed to, you're able to build a huge tent. You can bring people who freaking hate each other, who would like disagree on any number of topics, but can come together and say, kids need clean water. Moms need clean water. Dads need clean water. So I, I, you know, I'm, I'm deeply dissatisfied with how little we have done at this point. I was encouraged the other day, I saw a 27 year stock chart of Amazon. And in the first 20 years, 7% of the value of the company was created. And in the last seven years, 90, uh, what was it? 93% of the value was created. So like the first 20 years, is just a flat line. You know, revenue is growing, sure, but just, you know, no market pay up, no, and then boom, mm -hmm. you know, because they showed up. So I, I would hope that, you know, as we just entered year 15, that the best is, is ahead. Again, there's a lot of extraordinary wealth that, that could move from bank accounts, mm -hmm. uh, maybe from donor advised funds and could save lives today, could, could help people in the most tangible way, get access to clean water. So that's what I spend my time uh, and trying to evangelize and, and trying to reach those people. I think your story is particularly relevant to a lot of people right now. Um, you know, COVID work from home has changed life and it's never been easier to, to pick up a vice or to fuel a vice. And this has been exacerbated in the, the work from home era. And I'm, you know, from, from vaping to porn to, to drugs, it, it just has never been yeah. more prevalent. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for someone who is struggling with this or who would like to shed it, but is just having a hard time. Well, again, I, I really think uh, community matters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the people you surround yourself with, what are their intentions? Are they, are they trying to do good work? Are they trying to improve the lives of others? Are they asking the question of, of how we can be useful? I have a five and a seven-year-old. Our family motto is, how can I help? I just want my kids saying, how can I be useful? What can I bring to this situation that might help? Um, so I think it starts kind of by asking that, like, what's the intention of your life? If it's, if it's money, girls, porn, as you said, you know, it, it's, I mean, it just doesn't lead to satisfaction. I mean, I think anybody can tell you that. I think people even know that, but it's, I think they need a vision for their life, you know? So maybe I would encourage people to go and try and find a positive vision for your life that doesn't lead you into this world of excess, which just, it, it really is, is an emptiness, you know, at the end of it all. And some of the richest people that I have ever met in my life have been the unhappiness. Mm -hmm. But I also know wealthy people who are extraordinarily help, you know, you know, and happy and healthy and have great families because, you know, they're really asking that question, you know, how can I steward what I've been giving? How can I make it useful to, to others? Did you just give up all your vices on the spot? I went out with a bang, Aaron. I mean, I smoked three packs of cigarettes the night before uh, <laughs> I had to start the mission. I think I had eight or nine beers. I got fantastically drunk. Uh, there were stories of me kind of surrendering my passport and just reeking of alcohol. Uh, but, but I wanted, you know, I just think I knew I had to go, go to cold Turkey and, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a pretty extreme person. It's, mm -hmm. it's easier to go all in than maybe to try to find the balance. And, you know, I, I'm not saying I, it wasn't hard. I mean, there was a mm -hmm. lot of Nicorette, there was Nicorette plus the patch and, <laughs> you know, a, a lot of struggle, but I will say that it was easier in a way because my community changed you know, it might be a lot harder to quit drugging and drinking and smoking, you know, when you're out from midnight to three in the morning and everybody's partying. Mm -hmm. I was with doctors and surgeons. Okay. I mean, I was on a medical ship, like nobody really smoked. Nobody was doing cocaine, you know, on a, right. on a hospital ship in, in West Africa. So the intention of the community was really just much more wholesome, more adult, mm -hmm. uh, healthier. And it, it became a lot easier maybe to to, to do that because nobody was pushing me back in the other direction. I want to get more into that, but you know, I love how you talk about this notion of what your tombstone might read. There, there's so many people who go into business today and they're, they're making money and they're, they're, they're not negatively impacting people per se, but mm -hmm. 
when they're given that the opportunity to think about things and to reverse engineer them yeah. that way, it it's just such a beautiful way to think about it. Did you did you organically stumble on that, or did someone share that that concept? I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people have shared that concept. You know, when you write your ending, um, write write what uh, what it feels like at your funeral. You know, what are you are you known for being a, a you know, I mean, really, at this point in my life, I want to be known for being a, a great husband and a great father and a great friend. Uh, Charity Water is just one of, you know, the things that I would hope uh, my legacy would, you know, would include. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that's that's helpful because then you live your life towards those things. You know, making a bunch of money is not on my list. Uh, allowing a lot of money to flow through my hands to impact, you know, people's lives around the world, you know, billions of dollars flowing through my hands to provide clean water for others, that's on the list. But, you know, I think, I, I think it's a helpful exercise to, you know, I actually find the funeral exercise better than, than the tombstone. You can kind of mm -hmm. visualize, you know, as people come, are they sad? Are they joyful? Do they, how do they celebrate your, your life? I mean, is it, is it a party atmosphere? You know, wow, my, my dad or my grandpa or my mom or my grandma, they lived well, they lived with joy and with life and with generosity and, you know, stories of how, you know, you were helped, somebody was helped by that person. Um, and that's what I want, you know, my life to be about. It's interesting because you hear a lot of people think that they can't really start over or that they've studied something or gone in one direction and they've wasted a lot of time. And when I hear your story, I, I wonder, do you think Charity Water, when it started, would have been as successful as it was if it hadn't been for your work as a promoter for those 10 years? You know, a lot of people, I think, maybe mistakenly assume that I raised money from those people. So they were not the donors to Charity Water. You know, the, the kinds of people who go out and buy bottles of Cristal Champagne for a thousand dollars or a thousand euros, you know, those are not the people typically that are leaning into charity uh, and generosity. I think what I learned from that time was the importance of storytelling, of, of getting excited about something and then getting others excited about that same thing. So maybe said another way, I'm a promoter. Mm -hmm. What I promoted for 10 years, I would argue was, was pretty unhelpful. Uh, get past my velvet rope, get the best table at the club, spend lots and lots of money, and then your life has meaning. Aaron, you have arrived, right? What I've been promoting for the last 15 years is, hey, Aaron, if, if you are looking to use your time and your talent and your money, your resources uh, to, to improve people's lives, both in your, in your, your neighborhood and, and around the world, you know, your time and your talent and your money, if you're looking to end needless suffering and say, hey, how, how can I be a part of, you know, the flourishing of others, um, then your life would have meaning. So I, I think I'm still promoting, I'm promoting clean water. I'm promoting generosity, radical generosity. Uh, and I'm doing that by telling stories. It's just the intention is very different than, uh, than what I was promoting previously. Right. I, I think there's a lot of people who as they get further in their career, as they spend more time building their business, building their charity, being passionate about their cause, they lose track of their ability to actually communicate it in a way that, mm -hmm. that people care about. They're, they're so fixed in it. And I'm wondering if you have any suggestions or any stories from how you go about promoting your work that, that can help people like this. I think there are two questions there. So one is kind of promoting the work and telling the story and getting people to care. And I will say that, you know, what's, what's so difficult about Charity Water's mission is that I'm going to round up to 100% of the people who I talk to, who I'm asking to get involved or donate or, or volunteer, have never experienced the problem. Yeah. You know, rounding up to 100% of people have never, that, that are, are giving to the org, that have never had to walk eight hours with 40 pounds of dirty water on their back. They have never worried about getting raped or attacked by a lion on the way to the dirty river where they get water in, in a trip that took them eight hours round trip. Mm -hmm. uh, they've never held a child 
who died in their arms of diarrhea. They may have had a, a children with diarrhea. God knows my kids have had it, but they would have gone down to the, the drugstore and gotten that you know, blue medicine and rehydrated their kid and their kid was fine. So I think that's, that's kind of challenge number one. Now it's different with maybe a cancer charity, right? Almost everybody, every one of us has been affected by cancer in some way, whether it's a family member or a friend or a colleague, you know, homelessness, right? So many of us have come face to face with, with people who, who lack housing or, or lack the, the ability to go out and get a job. Um, Water is just not like that. It's 771 million people who globally don't have access to clean water. One in 10 people alive. It's just, I'm talking to the nine, not the one. So I think that all starts with storytelling and, and Charity Water has now made over 1500 videos, probably close to 2000 videos now telling these stories, telling stories of what it's like not to have water, of these amazing, heroic, courageous people who just got trapped in a village without the resources that they need for, for, for health, for, for life. So I think that's number one. And then you know, the second thing is to solve the problem, we're actually building tangible things. They have a physicality and a location. So it's a well or it's a rainwater harvesting system, or it's a, a gravity fed water system with networks of pipes and a pump. So we're able to show a donor, your money built this, and here's where it is. So we were the first charity uh, in, in the whole space just to put every one of our projects up on Google Maps, on Google Earth, uh, so people could actually see the satellite images of these completed projects. And you know that, that was free. Right? We needed to go and collect all that data. We needed to go build the back end that, that presented and visualized it online. But you know, there was no cost to, to put all that data up on, on Google Earth or Google Maps. So I think we were lucky that 15 years in, mm -hmm. we built almost all of our systems with that feedback loop in mind. We weren't trying to shift a billion dollar charity that had been around for 100 years into this kind of micro reporting uh, framework, if that right. makes sense. So, you know, then you just get creative about how you connect donors. I mean, I remember when we started crowdfunding these million dollar drilling rigs because we needed to go faster in some of these countries. We, we had more money than we had the capacity. Well, we said, all right, we have a million dollar drilling rig. Let's go put a GPS tracker on it and give it a Twitter account. The GPS tracker, I think, cost $250. And, you know, we told our local partners in Ethiopia, when the well drills, press this button and it'll tweet, hey, I'm drilling a well here. You know, so just these kind of simple ideas. But if you were one of the thousand people who crowdfunded that drilling rig, it's a little extra point of connection. You could mm -hmm. follow it on Twitter. You could see where it was at any given moment. It just, it just made it more real. So, so many of our activities, Aaron, have been trying to bridge the gap. You know, sometimes where the money is actually going uh, the people who are being helped, they're thousands of miles away. They live in radically different contexts and environments. Can we bring that to life? But can we do it in a way that is not deploying shame and guilt, but really in, a, in an aspirational, invitational way? And we're doing something so amazing. We're providing people clean and safe drinking water every day across 21 countries. Do you want to join us? Yeah, do you want to join us in this inarguable common good? Do you want to add your voice to the community? Well put, my friend. I love that. Thank you. I, I understand that through all of this drilling and some of your work and uh, a Google grant, you also have the largest flow rate water data sets, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the problems with the sector, uh, and, and we were, you know, certainly know better for a while is that, you know, we, we go out there and we fund water projects to the best of our ability with the goal of them all being sustainable. Now, these are in rural areas. You know, often these are in villages where, where there's, you can't drive a car into the village. You know, the materials, the pipes, the pumps are being carried on the back of donkeys or camels or, or people's backs to get it in there. So really remote operating uh, environments of the world. And I think, you know, our first kind of innovation was we just want to know where these things are. You know, like, let's just like know where the projects that we build are. 
And, you know, on day one, we would test the water to make sure it was pure. We would take a picture of the completed project. We would take the GPS coordinate and we can kind of put that on Google Earth. But, you know, if you ask me eight years later, well, how's that well doing? Well, we don't know unless we go and visit it. And we have thousands around the world. So, you know, about six years ago or seven years ago in, in the, the dawn of the Internet of Things, right, when mm -hmm. Nest came on and, you know, Ring and, you know, Alarm, like we could kind of, the connected home. Mm -hmm. We just said to ourselves, well, could we connect a well to the cloud? You know, what if we could develop a sensor where we could install it on a well when it was built and it would just fire up usage? It would fire up flow rates. And, you know, not that we needed to measure the flow rates with any spe specificity or granularity, but really, if it stopped working, we'd know we have a stranded asset. Mm -hmm. And then this would almost force us to then have to figure out the maintenance problem. Um, you know, and then we said, well, we probably better get ahead of that at the same time. So in all the countries we're going to drop sensors, let's sure let's let's build up these mobile mechanic businesses who can then go out and make those repairs. And, you know, oh, my gosh, Aaron, I mean, it's taken us so long. It was a five million dollar grant from Google, which allowed us to get started. And, you know, we did R&D. We worked with 20 labs around the world uh, in our pilot. Like you said, we got the largest data set in the history of the world just because nobody bothered to do this before. You know, nobody hooks up uh, marginalized people's water systems to the Internet. Um, and then we realized, you know, and I think in our pilot, 90% of our wells were working. Okay, well, we have 10% uh, that are down on any given day. And then the mechanics started going out and we started learning more about the failure problem. Sometimes it was for lack of a spare part. So then we had a supply chain uh, set of challenges that we would begin to address. Uh, sometimes it was because the community uh, wasn't saving money. You know, I, I'll just use a a well as an example. So we fund 14 different water solutions across the portfolio. One of them is a well. Um, uh, you know, we have, we have a, a farmhouse in Pennsylvania and we have two wells on the property. You know, they're just dug into the ground and we drink well water. A lot of people do. Um, this is kind of a, the same idea at a community level. 300 people might share that same borehole, that same well. So, you know, we, we found in some cases, so a well is, is like a car. You can buy the car, but then you're going to need to maintain it over time. You're going to need to pay some money for oil changes. Uh, just this week, I just unfortunately today, I wrote a $1,400 check for my used truck because all the brakes needed to be replaced and the calipers, right? So, so that's kind of a, but I hadn't, that was a repair made at 52,000 miles, right? You have different mufflers and all these mm -hmm. different challenges over time. I had the money. Uh, you could argue saved for that repair. You know, I had counted the cost. I bought a used truck and I knew that this would happen. So that's one of the big things that we need to do to be successful in each of these communities is to make sure post implementation that the community is collecting that money. It can only be $61 to change some of the parts out, the ball bearings, the wear and tear mm -hmm. on the well. And that could, that could even be two or three years later, but that's challenging. I'm just going to be honest. You could save the money, but we've heard instances where then the, the chief in the village's son is about to die of malaria and they go and drain all that money to save his life, to take him to a clinic and get him life-saving malaria medicine. Well, I mean, who could blame the, the village water committee because the well is functioning at that time. But then a month later, if it breaks, there's no money to fix it. So Charity Water is just, we're, we're trying to solve all this and we think it all starts with the knowing, the knowledge of functionality that then allows you to address the myriad challenges post implementation. I will say we have a team this week, I just talked to them a couple hours ago in Uganda, and they visited a charity water well built 12 years ago that was benefiting the whole community. Clean water flowing, they, they pumped it today. Uh, this well costs, you know, if, if it costs $10,000, you know, you're looking at $900 a year. There are 300 people in the village. And what was so cool to them was they met all these kind of kids who were eight and 10 and then, you know, and 12. None of those kids remembered the dirty water. We remembered it. Mm -hmm. We were there 12 years ago. <laughs> we knew how disgusting and brown and viscous. We knew that that was killing the children of that village. But now you have this whole generation of kids growing up. And, and what was interesting is that the old people in the village 
are like yelling at the kids not to spill water because they lived through, you know, they realize what a, a precious asset mm -hmm. this is, what a fragile resource this is. The kids are like, well, all I ever knew was this well. And every single time I pumped it, tons of water splashes out. So, you know, that, that all, all that to say it's so important. And we think, you know, the use of technology, the use of sensor data is, is one important piece in that. But, you know, then there's a whole lot of stuff that needs to come after, you know, to, to make a successful long-term project. And we're, we're investing millions of dollars in that, you know, much of it in R&D. So just to, to make sure I understand, when, a, when you put a, a well or a different type of, or one of these 14 water collection or catchment systems into a community, is, is the community generating revenue through that process or, or saving money to pay for future installs? Yes. No, they're saving money to pay for the ongoing maintenance of that. Okay. Uh, in, in a perfect world, they would be able to generate enough money to you know pay for the next well, but that's just we've never seen that uh, right. modeled anywhere in the world. You know, again, mainly because the communities we're working in are really at the very bottom of yeah. of kind of the the development chart. Um, just just to break down the stat a little more, so 771 million people now. Uh, as we record this, are drinking dirty water globally. So one in 10 people alive. But 82% of them live in remote rural areas. Only 18% of them live in cities and towns. So you know, think of these as, as communities where people are living on $1.50 a day, you know, maybe up mm -hmm. to $2 a day. Um, they do have the ability to save up a few hundred dollars in that maintenance fund, but not save up $12,000 for the next project. You know, it's amazing to me to to think about your first water install being in Uganda. Yeah, that one was still working 15 years later. <laughs> and I, I want to get there in a, in a moment. But something that I find quite remarkable about Charity Water is you're the first charity I've interacted with that feels like it's run like a for-profit, um, that delights its donors or, or customers um, and reports with the type of transparency that you usually see at a at a board and sharehold level with a with a rigorous for profit tech company. H has this always been how you've operated, and and why is that? Well, I think part of it, Aaron, was I didn't know any nonprofit people. I had no nonprofit experience, and I didn't know any philanthropists or or foundation you know, people in the foundation world. So I just knew everyday people. And they worked at MTV at the time, or Sephora, or Chase Bank. Um, <laughs> and I just tried to develop a charity that would work for them. And the biggest thing I heard over and over again was, I don't know where my money's going. I give to a big charity. I have no idea. Are they using it for overhead? Are they even using it at all? I mean, is it going in endowment? Is it sitting there? Do they need the money? There was such an idea that when they give, and I won't name any of the big orgs, but I think... You know, you could probably come up with three big names right now and say, well, if I gave to these orgs, which I have during an emergency, I just have no idea. You know, they, there was a general marketing, like we're here to help and we're going to go and respond to this disaster, but, but not a sense of connection to the actual donation. So hearing that, I, 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 I believed that the pie of givers could be significantly grown if people knew, number one, how much of their money would go to solve the problem, to directly solve the problem. In our case, building water projects that deliver clean water. And number two, that they could see a tracking or a, an impact of that. So I really just started with those two pillars and said, okay, well, can I create this 100% promise? Can I create a business model where I can promise that in perpetuity, 100% of every dollar you know, Euro, uh, right. Coming in pound, whatever, like goes directly to build these water projects and in a separate bank account, uh, a bank account that we will audit separately, will raise all that nasty overhead money separately. The staff salaries, the office costs, the flights, the phone bills, the toner for the copy machine, that'll all come out of a separate bank account. And I, I really believed that I could find people who could get excited about funding the overhead costs. A smaller group of entrepreneurs, of business leaders, of builders, 
uh, who, if we treated them like investors, almost like venture capitalists, um, they would realize how powerful this 100% model would be to offer to the general public. So 15 years ago, I opened up two bank accounts and I think there was a few hundred dollars that we started each bank account with or a hundred bucks, I can't remember. Um, but, but we have kept those distinct, separately audited now for 15 years. And uh, it, it's been challenging. And you know, I, I write about in the book, like on these times where we're almost insolvent, but we never touched the public's money and then something amazing would happen and somebody would give radically to the overhead side. You know, today it's a lot more sophisticated at scale. We have 129 global donors who fund the overhead and they're giving, they're, they're giving starts at $100,000 a year for the overhead. So these are high net worth families. And, and some of them are the founders of Spotify, Shopify, Pinterest, uh, you know, WordPress. Like, you know, a lot of them are entrepreneurs who have built something themselves and realize that you need the very best people to build something great. And they love paying for the software engineer salaries. They love paying, you know, for the water programs experts. That's allowed us then to invite millions of public donors in with that 100% promise. And I think that's been a real part. And then step two, because money is not fungible, we can track it in various ways. Right? We're not stepping on the public donations. And we could say, you know, in some of our uh, revenue streams, like your $6 went to this well in Malawi. It costs $11,629. 317 people live here. Click here to look at the satellite image of that completed project to a donor who gave $6. Incredible. But we kind of built that in at the very beginning. You know, it's very hard to imagine advising, you know, a huge uh, charity to kind of lean into that in such a radical way. Um, it, it's just hard to, to to steer a big ship, mm -hmm. you know, in, in that direction. Take me back to the first install. How how do, how do you go from throwing your first event? To, to actually building your first well. Yeah, we have to find somebody who knows how to build a well. So I flew out to Uganda to find people who knew how to build wells. And where in Uganda? Northern Uganda. This was um, during the IDP crisis. So okay. our first water project was in a refugee camp called Bobi. Uh, I remember it vividly. Uh, it, was, it was around uh, Gulu. And there were 31,638 people registered there. And I think they had, I think they had, Four wells, six wells. They should have had 300 for that amount of population um, or, or 200 for that. So I found uh, a, a local well driller. They were called Joy Drilling. And they said, if you give us this much money, um, again, this is so, so many years ago. I don't even remember the economics. We'll drill a well and we'll send you back the pictures and the proof. And then we did. And they drilled the wells. And then we jumped on a plane and we went to go visit them you know, because it was so exciting. Like, are they working? Like, are people using them? And then we met the community and, and then we sent those photos back to all the people who had, had paid for it. And, um, you know, over time, you know, it's funny, people ask that question a lot and I don't really know how to answer it, but as you go deeper in your sector, you learn, you know, provisions. I'm not sure that like Steve Jobs had any idea how to actually build, you know, computer chips in the beginning. It was probably a bunch of people that flew over, you know, to Asia and met with a bunch of suppliers and started relationships and then, you know, worked that out. So for us, it was really boots on the ground travel. We'd fly to Kenya. We'd say, who is involved in the water space? We'd go meet with seven organizations and we'd say, these two are awesome. These two are really not so sure about, and these two maybe later. And then we would build those relationships. We would pilot. Uh, we'd go back, we'd check on the work. And then, you know, you're building relationships and Charity Water now is in a position where we're, we're intentionally trying to scale our partners uh, across 21 countries. We're doing a huge partner summit. Uh, we, we now employ over 1,500 people around the world working on water you know, throughout these, these countries. We indirectly employ that. We pay their salaries through the local partner organizations. And we're now starting to bring everybody together for knowledge sharing and actually get more drilling rigs into the field so we can increase kind of the absorbative capacity of the water sector to make way for more funding. So, you know, you, you have to do a lot uh, mm -hmm. in, in this space. <laughs> you've got to get people to care. You've got to raise money. You have to deploy that capital efficiently. Uh, you have to then, you know, provide feedback on 
on that to, to your donors. Yeah. So for a community that goes from no water to water, what sort, what sort of impact do you see? How do you see it changing a community? Oh my gosh. I mean, I wish we had more time, but you know, we, well, water means health. Uh, a community that has clean water sees immediate health benefits. There are 26 diseases you can directly track to bad water. So the incidence of those diseases plummets. I mean, we've seen 82% drop in diarrhea, you know, uh, among kids under five in some of this. It's literally saving life. So there's a huge health impact. You know, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> not surprising. Um, if we had to go drink from swamps in our backyard, we'd be sick. We would have diarrhea. We would have dysentery. We would have many of these diseases. We'd have parasites or worms. Number two is really education. And we, we many years ago got involved in building water projects at schools. And then alongside those water projects, latrines, toilets, realizing that to get teenage girls to attend school, they needed water and they needed a bathroom. Mm -hmm. And in fact, many of them would stay home, you know, that four or five days every month uh, and try to go to school. But, you know, they're not going to school with no, no water and sanitation. And then they would fall behind in their studies and you know, they, they would go back to doing the household chores and carrying the firewood or the water anyway. So we realized there was a huge, uh, we, we could make a huge impact on education, not by just providing clean water at schools, but also to, to kids in their communities. You know, the third, I think, is time. And that's, so 40 billion hours are wasted in Africa every year just by women getting water. That was the stat, you know, when I started Charity Water. Uh, I'm sure it's come down now. But you think about the, the waste of time, you know, that a six-hour daily journey is to get dirty water. And it's not, it's not five days a week. You know, you don't get the weekends off. Uh, if you take the weekends off, you don't drink water. Your family goes without. So when we're able to bring clean water close to the home, you're also giving you know, millions, uh, hundreds of millions now of hours back to women that then are able to turn that time into productive uh, income generation, uh, mentoring of their family, spending more time with their kids, kind of, you know, leaning into community development. So it's really the gift of time as well, the gift of health, the gift of education and the gift of time. And you get this kind of big transformation that all starts with, with water. Scott, thank you. I, I know you got to jump, but it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your incredible story. And I just want to make sure that our audience follow Charity Water on social media and visit their website, charitywater.org. And I really look forward to continuing the conversation. Well, thanks for having me. And, and listen, you know, uh, if, obviously, charitywater.org is a great place to go, but people can also check out thespring.com. And we've got an awesome video there. Uh, that's gotten like 70 million views. So if you just wanted to see some of the images uh, or learn more about you know, our, our community or joining our community um, now across 147 countries, the spring.com is probably the best place to go. And um, even just watching and sharing that video helps. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Impact in the 21st Century by Symbi Foundation. We hope you found listening to it as meaningful as we did. If you enjoyed listening, please consider subscribing to us on whichever platform you're listening from and leave us a review or a comment to let us know your favorite moment. Or feel free to recommend a guest for future episodes. Thank you again to RBC for sponsoring this episode. It's sponsors like RBC, which helps Symbi Foundation create the impact that we do. Symbi Foundation builds bright boxes, solar powered classrooms built from shipping containers that provide educational technology, digital learning material, and sustainable energy through a microgrid to entire schools and communities. If you'd like to learn more, feel free to visit symbifoundation.org. Thanks for taking the time to listen, and we look forward to bringing you more stories of positive impact in the next episode.